Good morning. I'm sorry I've been away from my desk for much longer than I would have liked. And I want to thank everybody who has stepped up, in particular the first Secretary of State, Dominic Raab, who's done a terrific job. But once again, I want to thank you, the people of this country, for the sheer grit and guts you've shown and are continuing to show. Every day, I know that this virus brings new sadness and mourning to households across the land. And it is still true that this is the biggest single challenge this country has faced since the war. And I in no way minimize the continuing problems we face. And yet it is also true that we are making progress with fewer hospital admissions, fewer COVID patients in ICU and real signs now that we are passing through the peak. And thanks to your forbearance, your good, good sense, your altruism, your spirit of community, thanks to our collective national resolve, we are on the brink of achieving that first clear mission to prevent our National Health Service from being overwhelmed in a way that tragically we have seen elsewhere. And that is how and why we are now beginning to turn the tide. If this virus were a physical assailant, an unexpected and invisible mugger, which I can tell you from personal experience it is, then this is the moment when we have begun together to wrestle it to the floor. And so it follows that this is the moment of opportunity. This is the moment when we can press home our advantage. It is also the moment of maximum risk. Because I know there will be many people looking now at our apparent success and beginning to wonder whether now is the time to go easy on those social distancing measures. And I know how hard and how stressful it has been to give up, even temporarily, those ancient and basic freedoms, not seeing friends, not seeing loved ones, working from home, managing the kids, worrying about your job and your firm. So let me say directly also to British business, to the shopkeepers, to the entrepreneurs, to the hospitality sector, to everyone on whom our economy depends. I understand your impatience. I share your anxiety. And I know that without our private sector, without the drive and commitment of the wealth creators of this country, there will be no economy to speak of. There will be no cash to pay for our public services, no way of funding our NHS. And yes, I can see the long-term consequences of lockdown as clearly as anyone. And so, yes, I entirely share your urgency. It's the government's urgency. And yet we must also recognize the risk of a second spike, the risk of losing control of that virus and letting the reproduction rate go back over one. Because that would mean not only a new wave of death and disease, but also an economic disaster. And we would be forced once again to slam on the brakes across the whole country and the whole economy and reimpose restrictions in such a way as to do more and lasting damage. And so I know it is tough and I want to get this economy moving as fast as I can, but I refuse to throw away all the effort and the sacrifice of the British people and to risk a second major outbreak and huge loss of life and the overwhelming 
of the NHS. And I ask you to contain your impatience because I believe we are coming now to the end of the first phase of this conflict. And in spite of all the suffering, we have so nearly succeeded. We defied so many predictions. We did not run out of ventilators or ICU beds. We did not allow our NHS to collapse. And on the contrary, we have so far collectively shielded our NHS so that our incredible doctors and nurses and healthcare staff have been able to shield all of us from an outbreak that would have been far worse. And we collectively flattened the peak. And so when we're sure that this first phase is over and that we're meeting our five tests, deaths falling, NHS protected, rate of infection down, really sorting out the challenges of testing and PPE, avoiding a second peak, then that will be the time to move on to the second phase in which we continue to suppress the disease and keep the reproduction rate, the R rate, down, but begin gradually to refine the economic and social restrictions and one by one to fire up the engines of this vast UK economy. And in that process, difficult judgments will be made. And we simply cannot spell out now how fast or slow or even when those changes will be made, though clearly the government will be saying much more about this in the coming days. And I want to serve notice now that these decisions will be taken with the maximum possible transparency. And I want to share all our working and our thinking, my thinking, with you, the British people. And of course, we will be relying, as ever, on the science to inform us, as we have from the beginning. But we will also be reaching out to build the biggest possible consensus across business, across industry, across all parts of our United Kingdom, across party lines, bringing in opposition parties as far as we possibly can, because I think that's no less than what the British people would expect. And I can tell you now that preparations are underway and have been for weeks to allow us to win phase two of this fight, as I believe we are now on track to prevail in phase one. And so I say to you finally, if you can keep going in the way that you have kept going so far, if you can help protect our NHS to save lives, and if we as a country can show the same spirit of optimism and energy shown by Captain Tom Moore, who turns 100 this week, if we can show the same spirit of unity and determination as we've all shown in the past six weeks, then I have absolutely no doubt that we will beat it together. We will come through this all the faster and the United Kingdom will emerge stronger than ever before. Thank you all very much. You must stay. Boris Johnson today returned to the helm of government a month after being diagnosed with COVID-19. And boy, oh boy, a lot has changed in this battle against coronavirus. A lockdown has been extended and there doesn't seem to be a roadmap out yet. However, Boris Johnson did warn today that the public should be very wary of lockdown impatience, saying that we are coming to the end of phase one, but we're at a very important point. So where to next? What should be at the top of Boris Johnson's inbox? And what does phase two look like? Let me bring in Dr. Hilary Jones. Hilary, what was your reaction to Boris Johnson's statement outside number 10 today? And where do you think phase two is gonna leave us? Hi, Dan. Well, it was good to see the Prime Minister back at the helm. Uh, I think that's the statement he wanted to make. He's back, he's gonna be in charge. And he thanked the people who'd been deputizing for him. But he also thanked, importantly, uh, everybody who's been behaving responsibly in lockdown 
because this has uh, flattened the peak. It has allowed the NHS to cope. And he made that very powerful message very plain that the NHS has coped. The peak uh, has probably passed. Um, but he said that although the tide shows signs of turning, it certainly hasn't gone out yet. And uh, there's the risk that the tide could come back in if we ease lockdown too quickly uh, and uh, in too uh, great a way. He said, didn't he, that we don't want to be in a situation of reimposing sanctions uh, in the future because we see a, a rise in cases which overwhelm the NHS again. So I think it was balanced. I think it was positive. Um, I think he sounded upbeat uh, and Churchillian in his uh, in his address. So I think it is important that we all realise that this virus isn't going to go away anytime soon, um, that uh, it's going to take quite a long time uh, to meet the demands and the challenges that it um, that it um, it gives us. And we all still need to be disciplined and not to break the rules to uh, well, at all, really, if we're going to get a handle on this and get things under control. And just, Hilary, on a personal note regarding Boris Johnson, so it's a month since he had COVID-19. He didn't go on ventilation, but he did end up in intensive care, so we know he had this thing bad. In your opinion, is he ready to return to full-time work, or does he have to be careful about managing his workload? I think he has to be careful. He he went through um, a lot. Uh, it was touch and go, uh, not according to him, but according to his nursing uh, team and his medical team. And he would have taken advice. Some people recover um, remarkably quickly, even when they've been quite unwell. Um, and other people take a lot longer. So I, I think probably he'll be delegating some of the work that he normally does, I imagine. Um, he, he didn't look back to his complete normal self, I thought, uh, uh, outside number 10. But definitely he'll be listening to his medical advisors. And if he feels that he is regressing again, no doubt he'll put his feet up a bit more. But uh, hopefully he's completely well and uh, on that path to... ...side is proving tougher than ever. And today on a Merseyside beach and on the seafront in Sussex and Cornwall, that showed. With the Home Secretary forced to warn the public again to respect the rules of lockdown. The action we are collectively taking is working and your sacrifices are undoubtedly saving lives. We know that people are frustrated, but we are not out of danger yet. It is imperative that people continue to follow the rules designed to protect their families, their friends and their loved ones. This will continue to save lives. Because despite the Herculean efforts of the NHS, today brought another terrible milestone. Over 20,000 people have now died of COVID-19 in the UK's hospitals, passing a mark that just six weeks ago, the government's scientific experts believed might never be reached. If we can get this down to numbers 20,000 and below, that's a, a good outcome in terms of where we would hope to get to with this outbreak. Today, an admission that felt like an awfully long time ago. When Sir Patrick Valance and I made that comment a number of weeks ago, uh, what we were emphasising was that this is a new virus, a global pandemic, uh, a once-in-a-century global health crisis, uh, and this was going to be a huge challenge, not just for the UK, but for every country. But if the virus is unpredictable, the grief it leaves behind is anything but. This is Julia Penfold, a grandmother and for decades a much-loved nurse who died this week in the same hospital she once worked in. She'll never be forgotten, never, because of, of the way she was and her work as a nurse. I mean, she was so loved in the hospitals for all the different uh, positions she worked as. The, the girls and nurses all made time to come and see her. So everyone wants to come and believe that, you know, Julie's not here. She's gone. A sobering reminder for those of us desperate to be outside of what we stand to lose if we give up on the progress we've so painfully won since lockdown begun. Rachel Younger, ITV News.